Well, I love MSG. It's been, you know, you know, growing up in the 80s, there was this big backlash against it. And people said, hey, it'll give you headaches and it's not good for you. That's been largely debunked. This is 5 to 9, a podcast where we discover the hidden passions and hobbies that engineering, product, and technology leaders obsess over when the workday ends. Hey, Mr. Tushman, how are you? Hello, Andrew. Uh, I'm doing great. I uh, got us up early in the good old days. I'm at the uh, the fabulous home office here with all the junk, right? I'm in my fabulous home office with a little less junk. Yeah, yeah I think you're getting, you got a nice designer back there. So yeah. uh, we already talked what we're doing here today, broadly speaking, but maybe for the mic, can you do a brief introduction? Like, you know, what's your name? What do you do? And, and, like, and then we can talk about the fun stuff. Sure. So I'm Jonathan Tushman. I'm a longtime Boston technologist. I'm currently the chief technology and product officer for a Series B company here in Boston called High Marley. So we're the communication network for the insurance business. Uh, so helping connect insurance carriers with their policyholders and helping them communicate more efficiently. I've been doing that for roughly two years, but I've been in the Boston tech space for the last 20 years as a hands-on keyboard technologist uh, and product guy, specifically tends to be in VC-backed early stage companies. You're the best in many ways, but the, the part that's cool is you're a good nerd, uh, but you're also a B-school guy, so you got both slices on you. Yes, right. A little bit of nerd and a little bit of business. But I think I err more on the nerd side, as you would see in my office here with lots of, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So here we're doing today. Um, I called you up because uh, we have some common friends. We originally started the conversation, um, which is like Jonathan does big old cooking projects. And um, and I was talking to this common friend of ours, and it was originally talking about sourdough. I know this is a very pandemic era conversation. And uh, he's like, do you read this blog, right? Um, this blog, I think it's called Perfect Loaf or something like that. And and he uh, he said, like, I think Tushman put me on that thing. And so we, we fell into the whole discussion, the lore of you and your cooking projects and passion projects. So I don't know, was he right to tell me that? Was that the right for Like, are, are you into uh, projects? I think that's right. Cooking has been a big part of my DNA for the last 20 years. I think much more deeply in the last 10, 12 years. And I do think it all started with bread. Uh, and actually, I brought some visual aids here. It all started with this book here. Ooh. I don't know whether you've seen this one. I know, this I is Flour, Water, Salt, Yeast by Ken Forkish. Yeah. One of my two pivotal books that I've shaped my culinary career, culinary journey. Um, and like roughly 10, 12 years ago, I got really into baking bread in the house. And it's something awesome about smelling and making and having sourdough. And um, there's nothing better than bread. There's nothing better than carbohydrates. Do you still, do you have like a 12 year old, like 13 year old starter now? Is it still going from there? My starters die. So I go through these phases where I'm doing a great job on it, but then I'm not uh, shy of going into great bakeries and asking them for their starters. So I've been to scratch and scratch and, in Portland, Standard in Portland, High Rise here, and some other ones in the Berkshires. So every season I go and grab a different starter for my... Is it awkward? Are season. they like, uh, no, please leave, sir? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a couple times they've said no, but more often than not, uh, they'll go in the back and you'll have a great conversation. Okay. And I don't know whether you bake either, but I tend to... I'm a seasonal guy. So like right when it starts to get cold is my baking season. So right around now, for the next four months... Um, I'll be doing a lot of baking of bread. I still do it. Although I, you know, during pandemic, we were all baking a lot. And uh, like, I keep a little bit of a, like a write down when I did it. And I just did one recently. And I realized I hadn't done it since February. And so one, hey, life got busy because we're all traveling around now. But it's also like, I've learned the lesson of baking in the summer out here sucks because things just go out of control. Did your journal like keep track of like how much time and all the little details and how it came up? I did it for a little while. I'm a Mac notes guy because it's just like the easy, like I've fallen back to that's the easiest answer because it's a stream and it's in every device. So um, early on, I used to like super take pictures and like the notes of this stuff. Now I actually just kind of, I, I'll note the temp and the uh, the ratios. And then like if there's something that fails on it badly or something that like went well. So I just kind of keep it indexed for myself around how much I'm creeping up the hydration and stuff like that. 
But actually, since we're here, I think you're nodding, but you know what I mean. But like for other folks, what does that mean when I say hydration? What does it mean to you? Because you're nodding with me. Oh, yeah. So like, you know, in general, you're you're probably, I do two loaves. I use a thousand grams of flour and how much, you know, we're, we're, you know, we all have scales and we measure exactly how much water we want to put into the flour. I mean, bread is the simplest thing in the world. It's just flour, water, salt, and yeast. So all of the little dimensions matter. Temperature matters. Age of the yeast matters. Age of the starter. So it's just fun to have these little knobs. It's only four axes, but somehow it ends up being tremendously complex. All right. All of it. Yeah. Well, right on. The original point here was talking about you and your projects and I vectored us into bread. Like, what's cooking for you? Yeah, like if you're if 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 Jonathan is known for cooking projects, like what what kind of cooking do you do in these days? And what do you prefer to cook? What do you like? Is this big ornate feasts or what? What are we talking about here? So when I think about projects, the way I I kind of think is there's my kids went to Montessori schools and there's things about having sensitive moments where you just get into repeating things. So I think I'm kind of the same way with cooking, where I won't be working on one big, one big crazy (laughs) meal and event. Uh, I guess I had the upgraded OS on, uh, (laughs) on the Mac and now weird things happen on my screen. Um, But like every year or so I'll go through a season of, I'm going to focus on a certain cuisine deeply for a period of time. All right. Which makes a ton of sense. So like right now I've been really into wok cooking and Asian cooking. Uh, Before that it was Spanish. Before that was Italian which makes a ton of sense because the pantry around that you, you need to have and use repeatedly yeah. and you yeah. need to take whenever you cook something, you need to make it a bunch of reps before you get really good. So I think okay. you learn that with bread, right? Yeah. So yeah, with yeah, bread, yeah. You, the first time is, you know, pretty ma- magical, but the more you rep and you get it, it gets into your, your you DNA. You can feel it. You actually end up like you, you figure up some sensory stuff where you're like, Oh, this is feeling right. Right. Um, yeah. I kind of get that, so like, that instinct. Yeah. So right now, my, my main project for the last year, maybe year and a half has been wok cooking. So I'm using my wok two or three times a wow. week. I'm the Asian guy on the call here and I have wok and I definitely don't use it like it. So maybe once a month, I'll, I'll get a move in here. So my wife is Taiwanese. I'm Jewish. For a, a mixed race household, um, I think the way you get your background and your culture is through food. I think, I think that is, that's my religion. That's my way to bring people together. That's how you guys split the world. Like you, you're the one cooking the Taiwanese food or the Asian food. Totally. Or is she doing it too with you? Or do you guys tag team? No, so I, I, I'm, the, I'm the cook in the family, but you know, I think, yeah, so I, I, I'm super into Asian cooking. I feel like I'm bringing that to my, my Asian kids. So like, just to contextualize it, because you said earlier, I'm, I'm stocking the pantry every season. You're like, you're like the Asian gear and the walk, right? So like, did you do just some huge shopping trip? You know, how often do you st- stock in this, you know, seasonal flavor pantry? Like what's the stuff, what's the gear we're talking about here? Yeah. So, you know, I think there was in, in the beginning of the Asian pantry, there's a handful of ingredients that you start off with and then you go to from basic to more advanced Okay. Um, so you start off with, you know, soy sauce, rice vinegars, Chinese cooking wine, the other two ingredients that, and then you start going to the next level. And for me, that has been mixing it with the Korean palate. So I think, and, and, and by the way, I apologize to all the listeners here. I'm going to mess up all of the names of all these words, but it's the okay. Korean wait, chili wait, wait, powder. Save space for all this. We, we, we all get, space. get it wrong. Yeah. Korean chili flakes is, are is the best chilies flakes that you can have. I make a chili oil with that all the time. And Gogujan, the, uh, the Korean fermented spicy bean paste I use all the time. So one of my, my weekly meals, probably if you ask my family what my best meal is, it's a mapa tofu, okay. which I make weekly. And I do more of a Korean version of it. Okay. And then the more advanced ones here, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether to use these ones, is uh, I love a black vinegar. Um, and I love a dark soy. So I think in the beginning when you like, oh, yeah, it's a soy sauce, but there's all these different versions of soy sauce. Yeah. It's soy sauce. Like I use soy sauce. Like it's like, what's the difference on this stuff? But, but, but you now can tell. Yeah. So I now have three different soy sauces. Okay. Um, but the core ones is light and dark, which I use all the time. And then my new best friend who I brought up here as well is MSG. Oh, okay. Controversy. Talk to me about this. Well, I love MSG. It's been, 
you know, you know, growing up the eighties, there was this big backlash against it. And people said, Hey, it'll give you headaches and it's not good for you. That's been largely debunked. It's been wholly debunked. And now I view this as this magic, this magic seasoning that I put not just in my Asian cooking. I consume it from a restaurant. I don't actually use it at home. So how do you use it? Like, you have you, to, man. is it like a little salt, like a salt shake? Or are you like dropping it like on a sandwich? Or like what, 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 I, don't what do do it. I, I, I don't <laughs> use it raw. I don't think okay. people do it. I think it's a cooking seasoning. Uh, okay. You know, next to my, next to my cooking setup, I have a salt pig. Salt pig's the thing you put your hand in to get the salt, yes. right? Okay. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm a big fan of that too. So you have a you have an MSG pig? Yeah, I I, I do. I mean, this is the main thing I use, but I do envision eventually getting an MSG pig too. Okay, so you got a, okay, so you got a little shaker here. You're showing me that's like a like a I mean, pudgy. It, it feels good. It, it looks like yeah for all the listeners. The panda. Here, it, it, looks, yeah. it looks like a little panda, and it looks cute. Yeah. It makes people feel less afraid of it, and it makes it delicious. Yeah, and other places I put it into is like like Thanksgiving gravy. I put it into other kind of okay. pasta sauce. Anything you want. That's meat and game. You want to give it a little kick to. Uh, you give All it right. a kick to. All right. It's that Before umami thing, MSG, right? It's, it's the umami thing. Meaty, it's, the, yeah. it's the kind of meaty, unctuous flavor kind of thing. Totally. And before I was using this, I was using like a combination of soy sauce, Parmesan cheese. I, I, I use Marmite and Vegemite a bunch. All these things are like MSG, but like you're just working around the fact that you don't want to use MSG. So now I just go right to the source. Now I know the juice. Uh, so so I, now I got your walk, you got your things. Like, so how do we do the walk? Like, what's the walk set up? Like, what, you know, is there, is there a spatula? What am I using with this thing? Like, cause, so, cause I've seen them in the restaurant. It's like, shh, like doing that. Right. Okay. I guess another people are watching here. I actually brought my walk up here too. All so right, this like is uh, a made in walk. So the brand is made in. I love this thing. My friend, um, Chasey Chang of Pagu gave this to me a couple of years ago. So it has a little bit of like a real chef to use this. So I feel some of that energy in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's carbon steel. Carbon steel is another big transformation of my cooking career or cooking experience. So I'll talk about carbon steel in a second, but I love carbon steel in terms of my, my pans and for my walks. It holds heat super well. It gets, uh, it's easy to take care of and it basically acts as a nonstick. So my wok also is a um, has a flat bottom, okay. So it's not like a full, yeah, round wok thing. That, full round yeah. wok, which in an American kitchen we don't have a full wok set up. So I have a standard four burner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gas. What do you go? Because because I think you need gas on this thing, right? Because you know, yeah. Gotta, right. Because the the word I grew up learning is this word uh, in Chinese called wok hei. I speak Cantonese, yeah. so probably different than your than your wife says it. But like, uh, it's kind of like like walk fi wind or walk breath or, you know, yeah, when the fire yeah. comes up over the thing and yeah. it's a series of flavor. I can't pull that off with my setup. So like okay. in my dream, I will eventually have an outdoor kitchen with this one of these huge BTU flame things going yeah, on yeah. And where I'll be deep frying and have this thing walk. I'll be my dreams. I, I, this gets close to that. Yeah. Um, the other things I use, anyway, so I love this thing. I think everybody should have one. I'm curious what you have. So my setup is, um, I actually have a round bottom wok. I actually got it from my mom back in the day. I came out. My current stove right now has an extra attachment that you put on top of it to cradle the roundness on the thing. And like, it, it, it you know, it, it actually works. But like, if I'm really going hard on this, I, I've actually done the thing is take it outside with a turkey fryer. And like, and, and, and I've actually learned that thing is too hot. Like it's actually, you know, they talk about more, more cooking with gas, more BTU. Like you can go too hard in the thing and you're like, Oh my God, everything's just burning as soon as it hits. So it, it actually in that setup, you got to turn it down a little bit. But yeah, like I actually think this is actually an interesting discussion because like all, you know, when you get a new kitchen, now everyone's moving to induction and all these things totally. like that, which I think totally like a lot of great reasons why. The other thing though is like, I think. Asian cooking is one of the ones that actually uses, or at least Chinese, I'll say, like uses this kind of needing the burn part of it. Not just, not just, I'm saying it wrong, not like burn, like burn, like toasty. It's like the, it's a, the, the fire needs to kind of lap over the sides thing. And, and I, I, I grew up in California. I was talking to my dad about this and, and like, we're probably in California end up in some kind of weird world where like the, you know, most gas things will disappear except for, in the Chinatowns and stuff like that, because they need something to kind of get that flavor. 
Like they're talking about using propane instead because to like just like me using outside yeah. because to get around some of this stuff because certain kinds of cooking require not all kinds of cooking require, but like it, it to really kind of nail that cultural flavor and that style you need that. Anyways, that's my two cents on it. I'm curious how it's gonna affect home cooking. Like for everything else, like boiling water and even like frying eggs and stuff like that, I think it's okay. But I really think with a wok, I'll struggle not having the flames going up the side. So I mentally can't. See that there? I know it's a huge trend coming. I'm curious how, yeah, how it plays authentic out. Authentic Chinese cookers, uh, Asian yeah. cooking is going to do with the wok. Yeah, I'm sure we'll invent something. It'll be like a bonus top on, like stoves that have like. Given I said only whip this out one of mo- once a month, be like twenty not you know twenty nine of thirty of the real estate of the thing is like induction and it has a little gas kicker on it. I don't know something like that. Yeah, but also I, I'm like, I don't know if the word is violent with this, but like I'm pretty violent on it. I like and. When it's just like a pure flat surface, I worry that that same kind of motion is going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but see, that's that, that I think is like a a physical part of it. Then there's like the physical and the fire. I think the physical is probably handleable. I mean, my stove came with a little attachment that sits on top. Like it's like a, a flat burner. It does that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and, and what, we're we're actually speaking about walks here on this stuff. So let, let, let's go back real quick to your your concept of like you use the word carbon steel like what is that like how is that different than nonstick and then and then just ditto with the walk how do you treat this thing because uh we, we have a debate in the house on this whole thing yeah so there is a lot of debate on how you how you keep track of carbon steel so my, my walk i don't know if you guys can see it but you see it's really kind of shiny oh yeah it's better than mine yeah so after you cook it and you you know, you rinse it up with like a bamboo kind of thing. And you try not to use dish soap on it. You probably run under, you cook it and before it gets too set in, you're, you get run it under the sink with some kind of bamboo or rough cleaner on it, get all the particles off. And then when you're done cleaning it, you put a little bit of oil on the thing and you rub it with a paper towel. So you store it um, with a small sheen of oil. And I do that with all my other cast um, carbon steel pans. So, Carbon steel is like roughly half the weight of cast iron. Cast iron, yeah. Uh, but so so it's a lot more, you know, movable and feels lighter taking out of your thing. But it has the same kind of characteristics of uh, it being able to hold heat, and it also is a much smoother surface. Um, so that was another. Just having like this one. Another one of my core things I make every week is just. You know, salmon, salmon with the skin on or, or chicken okay. thighs okay. with the skin on. Yeah, yeah. And all you need with that is just if you take, you know, a chicken thigh and a carbon steel pan and salt, that's all you need. You put it face down with the skin, you render out the fat and you flip it over and you salt. Boom. There's something about and I wasn't able to do this with my normal. Was it steel, normal steel or? Cast iron, normal. cast iron, cast iron. They're not cast iron. The other pans that you have that you get. Oh, like oh. aluminum pans or like whatever the stainless steel. Oh, stainless steel things. Stainless steel. Stainless things. steel, yeah. So yeah, like yeah. like I never use stainless steel anymore. Okay. Um, I dig it. That's a pro tip. When yeah. I get my new pans here, I'm going to do this. No, and then also like for, for salmon with the skin, it's like an amazing, like you feel like you're a world-class chef just, but it's the pan in the, that does it. And it's much cheaper than any other pan out there. You just go to, but you, you have to go to Restaurant Depot to find these things. Okay. Or the internet. I'm sure the internet. Or the internet. Yes, there's also the internet. A magic thing. You press a button and things suddenly show up. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. I like both. All right. Okay. Well, we're talking about cooking here. And I think you and I both like cooking. We're, we're talking about this. Like, you know, how do you incorporate it in your life? Like, is it, you know, how do you, how does it dovetail with the work day and your family? Like, what does it mean for you? Yeah. Like, like, cause you cooking. said you already cook, you cook a few times a week. You're like making chicken, making salmon. You're walking twice yeah, a week. Yeah. Like, yeah like how, yeah, how does it all fit in? So cooking strikes a th- so many positive things in my life. So a, I, I probably every night that I'm home, I'm cooking dinner. So I'll probably cook three to four nights a week. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, how, how much are you in physical office, commuting, traveling for work yeah. these days? Like, how so do you we're, live your life? Yeah. we're hybrid right now. I'm in two and a half days a week, and then you know, and during pandemic, I was working from home all the time. And what I loved about one of the things that cooking was great for me was one of those barriers between the work day and the home day. And I call cooking is one of the few things that I'm able to do where my brain is not spinning on work. So it works really well. I come home, I'm able to you know pour myself a glass of wine, start cooking, and I'm 
It's a great segue from my work day into my family day. I'm nodding at you because I I find cooking the same thing. Then he has all the other benefits. It's like, you know, cooking is like my love language. Like that's how I show love to my family and to my friends. So it's also cool that the side benefit of me doing this is showing how much I care to my family. And I love seeing them enjoy. And there's also the whole creative aspect of it. So you're not making the same thing every day. I already heard that from the beginning. Different cuisines every season, different, yeah. you know, like meals every week, shifting from a little Taiwanese flavor up to Korean flavor, back and forth, right? You're moving. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then there's always the holidays. We have the Jewish holidays, the Chinese holidays, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's coming up. Those are all great opportunities to do something fun. Well, okay. So holidays, let's, let's get in this. Like, because I think holidays touch on a bunch of stuff around cultures, traditions, rituals, all this stuff, like, how do you mash them? Like, yeah, well, you, yeah. you said the Jewish holidays, Chinese holidays. Well, I'll tell you my favorite holiday in a second, but you go first. And well, I'll do my, th- my, my Thanksgiving I did last year, which was awesome. I did a Chinese five spice turkey, okay. which I smoked. It was awesome. Super awesome. And then, and then I did a sticky rice stuffing with Chinese sausage. Oh, so, yeah. Um, so a little bit of, you know, Good old-fashioned American Thanksgiving with some Asian flair to it. That was a yeah. big, big hit. I did a fun one a couple years back. Um, so you know that Thai-style chicken that's really kind of fish saucy, cilantro, yeah, yeah, yeah. coriander? And I did yeah. a big version of that with a spatchcock turkey that way, too. Yeah, um, I'm also so, spatchcock all the way. Yeah, turkeys. pro. All right, so how do you smoke a turkey and do five spice? How does that work? Yeah, let's get in there. Yeah, so I have a Traeger which I got a handful of years ago. Do you smoke stuff? I do. Uh, for another discussion, uh, weird trivia about me, I'm a certified barbecue judge, Kansas City Circuit. Um, so that was a thing that I did back in the day. I've done less so with the kids, but um, but yeah, so I like have, I have a bunch huh. of smoking rigs. Um, but I'm actually, right now I'm using a, uh, like a Weber Smoky Mountain. It's the tall one um, that looks like a rocket ship, right? So I actually, I, I think the pellet stuff is amazing, but as like, um, as a guy who, who's gone through that whole record. Like I think pellet, pellet stuff is too easy. I like to like my too wife harder. No, yeah. No. yeah. 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 No, I'm not, I mean, I'm not in the, in the advanced <laughs> world that you're in, but for me, I, a handful of years, I'm able to do it and it gives me some great flavor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So back to your Turkey though. Like, yeah, how, how did you go from like this? Uh, like, yeah, break it down. You got to the Turkey. We said spatchcock. We said five spice. We said Traeger smoker. What do all these words mean? Break it down. Yeah. Spatchcock is just a fun word to say, but basically all it is <laughs> is cutting out the back of the turkey and smushing it down. No matter how you cook it, whether you cook it in your oven or on maybe less so in the Traeger, it allows for more even heat distribution so you get more juiciness across the board. Yeah, it, it, it makes it all flat, like a big fat steak, yeah. right? Yeah. So you don't have that big, you know, when your grandfather used to come in the room and have this big turkey showing so you lose a little bit of that but i think you make up for it as ease in flavor okay okay and in terms of you know i always do a brine so i i I soak i'm actually i'm pro wet brine when it comes to a turkey i know there's explain what's a wet brine here yeah yeah so so a wet brine is submersing a turkey or whatever you're brining in a water bath with salt and sugar fundamentally and you can add other things to it like orange rinds and peppercorns but fundamentally it's just salt and sugar and water and everything else a little bit gravy and the salt makes it uh, lowers the chance of you making it less dry uh, and the sugar gives a little bit of sweetness to it um so for my turkey last year i'll uh, will have done a brine and then what i do next take it out is i you have to get underneath the skin so you okay. have to be not afraid of getting your hands dirty. You like, use a glove or you just getting up in there? No, I just get in there. Yeah, okay. Roll up my okay. hands. You know, there's, yeah. certain, there's a few spots where it's easy to get under the skin. And just with some olive oil and then with, you know, again, with some salt and a bunch of, you know, Chinese five spice, you get in there and you rub it underneath the skin and over the skin. I got a trivia for you because I don't fully, I think I know this, but what are the five spices in Chinese five spice? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I can guess, but I don't know. Do you know what they are? They're not as foreign as you think they are. I actually, so the one that I actually, I don't know them all, but, but one of them is fennel, fennel seed. Huh. And like, it's one of these things where you're like, oh, these actually are cross culture things that you didn't think of. Um, that I, I don't know the like food etymology of how it got there or like what came first, hmm. but it's also like, it's just interesting which things actually come 
from other place. Okay, so it, it's star anise, it's uh, Szechuan peppercorn, fennel yeah. seeds, cloves, and cinnamon sticks. So you actually, if you think if you drop the peppercorns and star anise, it's actually a very Western sounding spice totally. mix, right? Yeah, and then all those spices would would feel good on a Thanksgiving plate, right? And and so the question is, and, and probably what happened is, you know, what we consider Western is probably came from that direction, right? It's the other way around, is what we we probably process. But who knows, right? Like, yeah, it's spi- I, don't, I don't even know if five spice is a Western thing. Like, is only done oh, I don't think it is. But I'm saying the co- the composite pieces of it, right? Like, yeah, you know, like we use each of those. But I mean, not star anise and such, but the other three we use. In various forms of Western cooking, right? Um, yeah. And and like, how do they pull there? So tell me about your Thanksgiving. Oh, oh wait, no, before we were there. Like, so we got your turkey, we got your five spice on there, and then you said you smoke it on a Traeger. Break that down for me. What is, what, what is a Traeger? Like, what does smoking mean? And then we'll go to my. Got it. Yeah, so Traeger is a cheater version of a smoking rig. So basically, there is this auger, is a bunch of pellets which are basically dried wood, whether it's cedar or apple or what have you. And then it's there's a little um, auger that pushes it into the thing so it has a very controlled burn versus what you're doing in your pit master days is making sure that, you know, your dry wood and charcoal is heat on the side. So this is a very simple way to keep the heat consistent. So you can keep your heat at a 225 for a long period of time. That's a great thing about cooking in general is simple ingredients and time is where flavor comes from. That comes back from the sourdough days and comes back to smoking. Anything that has simple ingredients and time is going to be a win. How hard do you smoke it? I do. I don't know what hard means, but I, I keep it um, at either between 200 and 225 as the main thing. And then I'll bring it up at the end to finish it off. Is it getting like hammy at the end or is it like, because you could push smoke so far where it's like, you're like, oh, this is ham now. <laughs> like, or are we no. is still like, is it like some light smoke on this thing? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, like you'll see the rings on the edge of it and it'll, it'll yeah. feel like it's been smoked. So I think yeah. that's kind of a fun flavor. I like it. I like it. So what I want to hear, I, I want to have your, I yeah, so have I did. So, so like, the, the, well, yeah, we should barbecue one day. I'm, I'm like, one of the things I got better at during COVID is to hit a brisket, like a legit brisket and like. You know, wake up at five in the morning and really do it right. Yes. But like, you know, so my world of it, like, unlike yours, I have to tend it. So it's it's a different form of commitment. But like, you have to be around. And it worked during COVID time because I'm around, right? So like, it wasn't a big deal to go outside and check the temp and run things back and forth. And it's the best. There's nothing better than being outside with your meat being smoked yeah. and having a beer. Yeah. And and they get it a jiggly state. It's got that nice jiggle, totally. which, uh, which I was a big fan and, and, and doing all that jazz. So yeah, we should, we should do that. And did you wrap it with butcher paper? Yeah, I've been, I've been doing the wrap or AKA the Texas crutch as they do it. But like I do, a I hit the butcher paper wrap. It does. I, I think it works pretty well. How often can you eat a brisket in a year? I actually make it more of a celebratory thing. I, I don't like, I mean, again, there, there's two worlds, right? It's just like bacon bread. There was during COVID and then there was like, now. Like if you if I'm doing a full brisket, I mean that's a lot of meat, right? So point much and, meat. Point and flat, right? The whole end to end. Yeah. It's got to be a project for that. And, and like even if you say I'm going to freeze some of it, there's no way rational no, family of four can actually do it. So it's about the ritual as much as it is because I couldn't crush that much brisket, right? It, it's it's too much. Oh, speaking of the other thing that I've gotten recently is I got one of those outdoor rotisseries, stand up rotisseries, like a gyro okay. machine. <laughs> that was I don't know the where best. you get. Okay, time out. You have like a Euro thing, like we could yes. we could make like shawarma at your house yes, or we could yes, make yes. a real Alpau store. But that yes. feeds like two hundred people. But it's it's the event. You can make it a little smaller. It and that was that's been some of my my best food parties. Everyone loves being outside, the meat's spinning on the thing, you're shaving it off. Like I'm just trying to imagine how this is like the size of a phone booth and you've got like and no, you bring like two hundred like, like it's it's like a small one. It's like Three feet or two and a half feet, three feet. And, and you put it in the garage yeah. afterwards? Or like you put it in your like kitchen? Like where does this thing go? It's in the basement. Okay. And, I, and I'll put it up next to, you know, I put it on a table outside. Your family Dude. must love you or hate you. I can't tell. Or both. Oh, they well, love it. it. Be true. They love it. <laughs> Al Pastor was awesome. And yeah, it's super delicious. You make homemade, homemade tortillas. Dude, what other crazy equipment do you have that I don't know about that we need to know about here? Do you like a? Do you have like a? Do you have like a pig pit that I don't know about? Like, can we do roast whole hog in your backyard, or like, what? What can we do here? No, I think that's probably my. I think my smoker and my spit. And my spit's probably my my most crazy thing. And 
I highly recommend that you get one. It's not that expensive. Okay, all right. We go. We, I'm gonna double click on this. When does one decide to go get a rotisserie spit thing? How much does it cost? How do you get it? Do they have to bring like a special movers to bring it in? Like, how does this all go down? I think I watched uh, a YouTuber making it and said, like, "Crap, I'm gonna. I really want to do that." And I looked it up. It was like less than two hundred bucks. Maybe it was two hundred bucks. What? Yeah. Okay. In my head, I'm thinking kitchen industrial, a couple G's. Got to take no, some no, 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 big no. burly dudes to bring this thing into your backyard, bring it on a like crazy semi truck. No, no, not that crazy. So it, it, it's within reach, and it's okay. like you know, and when you're hosting a party, it's not you know, compared to getting something catered, it's, it's all in that same. So you, you had to get all the meat, and you had to stack it and do this yep. stuff, and like so you marinate it, and you stack <laughs> it. I'll send you some pictures later on. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, we, we, we got any pictures. I mean, that that's a thing that, I mean, regular, let me be clear, regular people don't have that at home. I hate to tell you this, Jonathan, like, this is not a normal thing. And this is why I love you for this, but that's not a normal thing that people have at their house, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was a hit. Yeah, it sounds like a hit. I want to come over next time. You I think the it. next thing that I don't have that people would assume that I have is, you know, a solid outdoor pizza oven. Okay. I mean, those, so, those are, like, so, so actually, I know a little bit about those. Like, I have... Well, I have one of those uni ones. Those are great. Yeah, those are great. Those are super stellar. But I mean, if you mean like a built-in ceramic, like... I don't need, know the name of the brand, but they're beautiful. They're made in Italy. Oh, they're the, the Domi Italian ones. Brand. Yeah, 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 the yeah, yeah, ones. yeah. But here, um, here's the problem. I, I Like, I have a friend who has one of those. Well, it depends. There's varying sizes of them. But the amount of fuel you have to get to get the thing moving to the heat that you want to work with, it's a energy, time, and just, it's a commitment. I guess the other thing I have that I'm passionate about is is hot sauces. So on a scale from zero to ten, Andrew, how spicy do you like your food? Oh, I like spice, uh, but I, you know, I think you can get stupid. Like I, I think you push it to like you know I, I don't know what your gradients are, but like there's one of these restaurants right here called Hell Night, and their whole stuff is just to like just rip you. Like it's just like it just breaks you, and and like. You know, I, I've learned that most spicy food, like no matter how spicy, it kind of goes away after 15 minutes. Like you gotta, yeah. you're you going to die. And yeah. then 15 minutes, it gets a little better, right? Um, but wh wh where do you lie on this whole thing? So I ask this question a lot. Um, I am a enthusiastic six, meaning like I love spice. You like spice. the flavor, yeah. I love spice. I want it on everything. So I enthusiastically want stuff to be spicy. But I don't want it to be crazy spicy that I'm going to, you know, have stomach issues, but like, <laughs> a solid two peppers on any kind of menu is what I want. I want it all the time. I, I'm actually, I, I'm still trying to figure this out, by the way. Like, like so it turns out the whole spice concept is a thing that we have adapted as humans with certain kinds of like sensory things to like detect it. And so there are other animals that eat the same thing that they're like, I don't know, it's not spicy because the whole concept of spice is a receptor thing that we've adapted to, right? So like... So the question is, okay, so there's like, we perceive it. Does it actually do damage to your stomach and why? Or like, is this one of these things where, you know, like what's the juxtaposition? Is this like, like, are they both can be true thing or what's happening here? Yeah. I don't know. I, I love, I mean, I, I, at a certain level you start sweating and then I might have some indigestion. So I feel those things, yeah, okay. but mostly I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be challenged. All right. Well, anyway, no. so, so we've, we've had some sick projects, sick equipment, and, and you, you've talked about you working in seasons. So yeah. what's the, what's the 2024 flavor? What's the next season or what's the next aspiration? What's the next horizon? What's the big project that we're, we're thinking about right now? Like what, what's the, what, you know, what's the new frontier? I think I still, I, well, I don't know. I think I still have another like year and a half in, in Asia walk land. Yeah. So, it's a big world. I think I'm moving more towards Thai right now, more towards fish sauce things. I think that'll probably be the next evolution there. I would love to spend. So you should do. You should do. My, you should do my turkey thing then. You should do it that way. Think about yeah. that. File it away. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, I, I interrupt you. Hit it. Yeah, I want. So I want to know that turkey recipe. We'll talk about it offline yeah. later on. And then eventually, I would love to spend two years focusing on Indian food, and I would love to spend time more on the vegetarian side of things too. I love, not that I'm a vegetarian, I love meat and all things meat, but I love to focus on really nailing how to cook the vegetarian realm. Yeah. Um, and I love the Indian spices. I do, I do worry about how it smells the house up, so I need to figure that out, but 
and also making I mean, sure all, all these foods them. do like that's the cost of flavor right yeah. you, you, right flavor yeah. is not just in your mouth it's in the air so yeah, yeah like get get a big old hood and go hard on that thing yeah i want to fix the hood thing my hood is so loud in my kitchen yeah but you're probably pulling some good air out so yeah pick your poison that's a great great project here uh okay yeah so let, let, let's cap this out uh Favorite resources. You're inspiring me. Like, how do we, like, there's so many ways to go with this, but like, you talked about a book that got you started in, in baking, but how do we get to be you? Like, what, what, like, yeah. Yeah. I have a handful of go to resources. Um, so I think first, my first one uh, was Kenji. So Kenji Lopez Alt. He used to be a writer for Serious Eats. Uh, then he's wrote a couple really great cookbooks. If you basically search Kenji, anything you want to make, that recipe is always going to be like spot on. He comes from MIT. He's a scientist. And whatever it is, his flavor profile matches my flavor profile. He's a great writer and a great author. So he's one of my standard guys. He has this book called The Walk, which is came out um, like a year ago. I think if anybody's interested, it's a beautiful book and it's great inspiration. Similarly, online, there's The Walk the Walk of Life or The Walks of Life is a family that um, blog does video blogs and articles on Asian cooking. They're a wonderful resource as well. Uh, so I think those are probably two of my main resources for Asian cooking. And in terms of like, I love watching YouTube and watching video, you know, chefs work. And I, I like the, the medium form. I'm not super into the, the 30 second, 60 second Short. So I like Josh Weissman a lot. I don't know if you've seen him. He's got weekly things. He's been a lot of inspiration. I think he was the original inspiration for, for me getting the rotisserie thing. Yeah, I think those are some of my core influences. Yeah, let me throw a couple back at you because I think you like a good good trade on on, on books on this stuff. Um, you were talking about Thai. I'm actually – the restaurant doesn't exist anymore, but I really like the book Pock Pock. Right? Mm. Um, it, 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 it's uh, – I think it's – this is uh, Andy, I forget what his name was, uh, but like there's a cookbook that he has also called Pock Pock, P-O-K, P-O-K. And cool. I, I think the pictures are great, but it, it's, I wouldn't call it accessible, but it was actually like a interesting, like it, it breaks down a lot of stuff. Um, I, I think some of the stuff is, is too, like on a regular basis, probably too, like it, it doesn't fit my pantry, but I, I like, so I take a lot of stuff from there. Mm-hmm. And then I think other things that I always I started reading. Um, ever read a woman in a British woman named Fuchsia Dunlop? No. Nope. Fuchsia, this woman named Fuchsia Dunlop, and this is maybe like a, over a decade, twenty years ago. She went to China and actually got trained in one of these Chinese Chinese cooking schools, like not for Westerners. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really cool, right? I think the original book is uh, Shark's Fin and Szechuan Peppercorn, I think, or something mm. like that. Um, it's like a little bit of a memoir of how she actually got there. Or one of her early books. Um, it's a fun read, both from a like, you know, just fun reading of nonfiction journey. But it's also then you kind of like hear about, oh, that's what, you know, like you're watching her process like from a, a like a Western British style of like, oh, this is what this spice or cuisine means. This is what, you know, um, fish scented sauce means and kind of go down there. So as someone that's actually a pursuant of like different kinds of Asian cuisine. I, I found those like cool, both from a journey and learning referential words cool. and how they connect there. So do those up as things to like read on those things. So definitely fun. Anyways. Okay. So I, I think this is a wrap here. Um, and, and, and thank you for sharing um, the things yeah, that you're into. Fun. Yeah. Andrew Lau here. I hope you enjoy this episode of five to nine. Don't forget to subscribe. So you don't miss out on our next episode. Who knows what hidden talents or hobbies we'll discover on the next episode of 5 Tonight.